The title of my presentation this morning is Does Convalescent Plasma Work? And I left that intentionally broad because we have a causal lab or a center that tries to figure out what works. And for this presentation, I will tackle that question for convalescent plasma. Convalescent plasma is serum obtained from individuals who have recovered from an infection of interest, in this case, uh, coronavirus disease. It's theorized to provide what is called passive immunization, uh, given antibodies before those individuals have produced or had the opportunity to produce antibodies themselves, potentially heading off uh, a severe response to disease early in its tracks. In the context of COVID-19 in the United States, Convalescent Plasma was made available in April of 2020 under the Expanded Access Program of the FDA for Compassionate Use of Convalescent Plasma. And then in, in August of 2020, under the Emergency Use Authorization for individuals hospitalized for the treatment of COVID-19. This is a treatment that generally generated a lot of excitement and enthusiasm early on. This is a news clipping from Newsweek from April of 2020 that stated that the Celtics basketball player Marcus Smart and three other players uh, were to donate blood to help coronavirus research. Uh, and there was speculation about which NBA players had recovered from coronavirus. Uh, the reason for this enthusiasm was one, there were promising case reports, again, from a local there were many of these across the country from this one from boston.com a news clipping that stated that a COVID patient dramatically improved after receiving the hospital's first plasma transfusion at UMass Memorial and this was in the end of April in 2020. Additionally as we all know at the time there were no proven alternative therapies there were no vaccines at the time um, and so we were all very interested in understanding what could be possible therapeutic interventions. And as a result, over the one year from those two news articles that I just showed and from the initial FDA compassionate use, April 2020 to April 2021, there were over 722,000 units of convalescent plasma administered for the treatment of COVID-19. So this is clearly, in some ways, a very successful and great effort to give therapy that uh, may work and with no alternatives, that's a lot of doses of convalescent plasma. In retrospect, this article written a year later in April of 2021, earlier this year, these reporters stated, looking back at these events, that well, because plasma was given to so many patients outside of a controlled clinical trial, it took a long time they said in this way to measure its effectiveness. And this article was titled, The COVID-19 Plasma Bloom is Over. What did we learn from it? To me, and I think to others in this room, this is very confusing because these reporters think that what Miguel described as a boring debate between trials and observational studies, they think it is a lot more exciting than it is because this seems like the perfect opportunity um, to perform an observational data analysis if when we're waiting for trials to enroll and to see those results. And that's exactly what we did in the summer of 2020. So at that time, what was known about convalescent plasma was that it seemed not to work well for individuals with severe COVID-19, but there was speculation about, given the mechanism that I mentioned of heading off disease, that it may work well for individuals with non-severe COVID-19. And that was the question that uh, we sought to address. To do so, we first specified a target trial. Again, this is the hypothetical randomized trial that we would like to perform if we could, and that ultimately was performed. Um, to specify this trial, we first gave a causal question. So we wanted to estimate the effect of convalescent plasma on the mortality of U.S. veterans who were hospitalized with non-severe COVID-19. 
and I'll give more details about this in the next few slides. First, in terms of the eligibility criteria for our target trial, we would enroll U.S. veterans who 21 to 80 who had been hospitalized over uh, this time period uh, at centers that use convalescent plasma that had given at least one dose. These individuals would have had to be had to have had a positive COVID test result within seven days of their hospital admission. And then in terms of defining non-severe COVID uh, disease, we specified a minimum oxygen saturation of 90% within the prior 24 hours of eligibility and no uh, receipt of advanced medical interventions, uh, for example, mechanical ventilation, uh, ECMO, or even a high flow oxygenation or non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Uh, and of course, these individuals who would be eligible could not have received uh, previously received convalescent plasma. They would also have had to have recent measurement of relevant vital signs and laboratory tests that would be done in, in any similar randomized trial. The treatment strategies were to a receive convalescent plasma transfusion, or B, for the second arm, do not receive convalescent plasma transfusion. We would leave it to the discretion of the physicians uh, when to give plasma, when to treat, so long it was, as it was within the first 48 hours of the treatment assignment. The treatment assignment would be random and non-blinded. Our outcome of interest, 30-day uh, all-cause mortality, and follow-up begins at treatment time and ends at 30 days later. The causal contrast in our target trial, uh, we could estimate uh, attention to treat effects or uh, uh, per protocol. The statistical analysis would be uh, straightforward for an intent to treat effect and as well for a pro per protocol analysis, which would be a non-naive analysis adjusted for baseline covariates. We could, for example, use inverse probability weighting for a number of other methods. We emulated this trial. Uh, it looks like this uh, slide is a little bit off, so I apologize. We emulated this trial uh, using the data source that was previously described uh, in Dr. D Dr. Dickman's presentation, which is the Veterans Affairs Corporate Data Warehouse uh, electronic medical record. When we applied these eligibility criteria, uh, starting with 14,000, surrounded over 14,000 uh, COVID positive veterans over that time period from May to November of last year. There were 4,755 uh, eligible patients. And this corresponded to uh, over 11,000 uh, person trials, uh, given that we could enroll each patient at more than one possible time. In each group, uh, this was 402 trials of convalescent plasma group, and a sample size of over 10,000 in the no plasma group. This is a table of baseline characteristics uh, for these eligible participants. The few different, there were some small differences uh, throughout the uh, baseline covariates. The ones that I'll point out that were a bit larger were glucocorticoid use uh, was higher in the plasma group and remdesivir use also higher in the plasma group. For the emulation of this target trial using uh, data from the Veterans Affairs Health Record, uh, we followed our target trial specification exactly with these three exceptions that I will show you. One for treatment assignment, we classified individuals to uh, side treatment based on their observed data pattern. And then we adjusted for baseline covariance using inverse probability weighting to emulate randomization. For our causal contrast, we did not uh, emulate an intent to treat effect in this case. Um, and so we uh, use the observational analog of per protocol effects. And for the analysis, this was the same for the per protocol effect, with the one exception that for statistical efficiency, we allowed individuals to enroll at uh, any of the first 48 hours of days of eligibility and then pulled the results 
in nest of trucks. This is the result of the emulation of the target trial. In the figure on the left of the screen, the y-axis is cumulative incidence of mortality uh, going up to 10%, and the x-axis is days from time zero when the trial started. Red line is complex and plasma group, uh, blue is not, there's no plasma uh, group, and then the shading around the solid lines represents the put y is 95%. As you can see, the curves are generally very similar. The risk difference at 30 days of mortality was at 0 0.3, uh, hazard ratio was 1.04, and the 30-day risk in the plasma group was 6.5% and non-plasma groups is In conclusion, we found no evidence for an effect of convalescent plasma on 30-day mortality for individuals with non-severe COVID-19. COVID uh, as uh, Miguel mentioned at the beginning of the hour, this was a case where the observational data analysis preceded the randomized trial that was later performed. Uh, and uh, we were glad to see that our results were replicated with uh, the really definitive randomized trial from the recovery group uh, that was subsequently published. I have to thank uh, many people who contributed to this work in the uh, VA Causal Methods Corps, uh, the Mayo Clinic Expanded Access Program, and uh, of course others in the Causal Lab. Thanks very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Just press the mic and hit it. Is this question is inspired by a problem where in this case one treatment also had to be done in very short of time, 48 hours? But where I, mean, I don't know the course of mortality, the problem that I have with my body. The early course of mortality is uh, uh, pretty big, like 15 20 percent. And uh, uh, the other difficulty is people's status change is very quick. So if I was wondering things about their health condition, I could see the very big changes very in small intervals of time. So the question is, is there any problem here when you let them start at any point in 48 hours where basically the really sick people don't live enough to start? And the people who start on, let's say, the second half of the interval, are there the ones who deteriorate substantially after starting? In which case, you need more about those measurements. Are I making sense? Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having I, I don't know the solution I suffer from. <laughs> No, thank you very much, Lisa. This is a question that we also struggled with. Um, I will make two points about this. One, um, it, I think in an ideal world, we would have enough data that we would be able to uh, limit, not have to pool each of these eligible times, of course, and just say, well, at, right at a time, at a very strict time zero, uh, these are the only individuals we will include, whether they start in one group they start or not. Uh, unfortunately, we don't want to exclude everyone. Um, and first, using just first eligibility is often impractical, uh, as we know. What we did, and I, I have a supplemental slide, I may be able to show it. So, what we did was we saw well, how bad does it get if we really loosen this definition? And so, this is what I had previously shown. The name is all of receiving plasma within two days or not receiving plasma within two days. If we loosen this and say, well, let's make a less defined, a less well-defined intervention, because really the problem is this is a, becomes a heterogeneous intervention where we have a, mi a pooled mix of people who received on days zero, one, and two, and also the confounding by indication potentially that you mentioned, which it is probably insurmountable uh, as we see here. Um, 
when we extend this definition to allowing a prescription of plasma within seven days of assignment, we suspect that probably those that received it very late in the course it may have been a Hail Mary effort, um, a last dish attempt. And so we see the curves really separate here when we allow this heterogeneous mix. And I think it's not very interpretable. Um, so we, I show this to say that, well, we at least were happy with our first 48 hours approach because we're not suffering from this problem uh, in the same way, but we, we don't have a surefire solution to it. Um, this was about uh, the same extent of, um, I, I put this up just out of interest, about the same extent of, of risk difference between groups as though we did not adjust for many uh, covariates for control of confounding. And so the left image is the one that shows treatment can be given anytime within seven days. And on the right is an image where we emulate randomization with uh, only age, sex, and race. And, and it's a quite a big difference again. So just to give a sense of the magnitude of, of the different efforts there. But I don't have a good answer for you on that version. We should tell that we won't be so long if we are in Yes. Slide 55, please. <laughs> there was another question. Um, so, for the uh, primary outcome, the confidence intervals were very low, 0.64 to 1.62. Um, so, could we conclude from this analysis that there really is no effect on our reference? And if we find the same as a trial, the recovery file also found a point less than round one. Can we even do a congruence? Because the office intervals are so wrong that this recovery trial found a zero for 80, it was also a detectable or 1.20. So, yeah, what do you think about it? Thank you. So, um, an important question about precision and ultimately decision making from these results. From our work, what I would say is that we can only provide the best possible estimates uh, that are available given that the data that we have. Uh, I think when we take it in conjunction, as you mentioned, with a very large randomized trial the recovery group, um, I think each case where a decision has to be made will be slightly different and the amount of uncertainty that is tolerable will be different in each of those circumstances, whether that's at the individual patient level who's deciding to take for themselves countless plasma, or for a government agency here or elsewhere to have a policy about the use of countless plasma. For the seven day results, did you address the survival bias problem that we can arise from having people um, waiting seven days for the therapy? Would you mind repeating? I just couldn't quite hear you. I'm sorry. Yeah, if uh, you address the survival bias uh, when you were using the seven day assignment. So, over the, what we did for this over the seven days, I, I hope this will address your question. Um, at each of those days, so the first or zeroth day up to the seventh day, um, we said you must receive complex and plasma on this particular day. Um, and then we pooled all of those results. And so for someone who had not received uh, plasma by the third day, the same we were interested in this, in the received plasma on day two, which is going to be pooled with all of the rest of the seven days. They had not received plasma. Uh, or, or sorry, let me restate this. Say that we're interested in, in the trial of received plasma on the fourth day. Again, this will be pooled with all of the seven days. And they did not receive plasma by the third day, and also they died on the third day. There, they would go into both uh, arms of the trial. Mm -hmm. We have an a, a question on the chat. And I have to tell you that the results are disappointing. Right? Based on the on the reports and on the clinical anecdotal experiences, we were very enthusiastic about the convalescent plasma and 
I think a related question from the audience is um, if you can tell us more about the adjustment for compounding and how did you adjust for the baseline uh, cobayas that you had. And uh, a follow up question do you think that compounding might be explaining this lack of uh, replication of the observed uh, effect or if there are other things on Thank you. Uh, thanks for asking uh, that question uh, to the person. This was another uh, thing that we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about, especially with the, some early reports of convalescent plasma being affected. Uh, we try to think about the magnitude of the effect of compounding in several ways, one of which I'm showing on the screen now, which is to say that we compare our results to adjusting for all of our priori covariates that would, be, that would be both prognostic and associated with treatment. And then the difference if we adjust for none or very few, which is the curve on the right. So we do see a lot of compounding. So we think that there's a lot of compounding at play in this analysis. Uh, and then I do have one slide that we also try to, to understand a little bit is our weighting to some extent working, not that there has to be or make that balance, so to speak, but this um, this figure shows standardized mean differences with the hash line at 0.1 or 10%. The, the blue squares are unweighted, and these are for all of the covariates. And the red circles are after inverse probability weighting. And all that I can say, we never know. If compounding is always a threat in observational data analysis. Uh, all we know is that it seemed like Confounding was a lot less of an issue after waiting um, and was a much bigger issue when we look at unadjusted results and the magnitude was of confounding could have been high. There's no way to know except we do have this randomized trial now, fortunately, that also uh, shows a similar result. Mm -hmm. If there are other person, I have a follow-up question. And what about the characteristics of, of the plasma or the plasma? Do you think that Later on, when you able to do that? That's a very good point as well. And thank you for asking that question. Over the time period in which we were allowing participants to be eligible for, for target trial emulation, the characteristics of convalescent plasma were varied. Some had high titers or high, high amounts of uh, neutralizing antibodies to coronavirus-19, others had low concentrations of titers, and presumably we expect that uh, the plasma with higher titers will be more effective based on the mechanism. Now, uh, later along the period of enrollment, the convalescent plasma began to be required to have only high titers, uh, only the plasma with high titers could be administered for treatment, uh, and that was a sort of quality check or restriction um, that was placed on its use uh, over time. There were not enough, um, uh, not enough data to look at subgroup analysis of high titer and low titer, unfortunately for our study. But uh, that is something that uh, maybe gives a little bit of, of hope or some uncertainty about uh, convalescent plasma use. Maybe there is a certain way that it, it could be more effective by and large, I think we, what we saw is that these results may be somewhat biased towards the null in our study uh, due to the heterogeneity, uh, but that could be an area for further research. There are two more questions that we can take from the chat. One is related to one, and you can comment on the potential correlation. Um, sure. So, Unfortunately, I'm not sure exactly what that question means, but I can do uh, uh, my best to answer how we selected confounders. We, uh, what we did was we sought to select confounders uh, that would be sufficient to, and this sounds circular, but to abolish confounding. And so we selected variables that, based on a structural approach, would be associated with both the outcome mortality and also associated with receipt of convalescent plasma. Thank you. The person is specifying this, that um, the 
the concern that the city has is that uh, the correlation among compounders can cause more results. I would I think have to know more information about the scenario that person asking the question is mentioning. Uh, I think in the way that we, I can give you more information about how we thought about this, we just thought structurally with a direct basically graph uh, about uh, which variables we would want to adjust for in order to remove a non-causal association between the intervention and the death. Because having the trial so is yes, some um, additional information. Uh, one last question is about uh, the, the follow-up with local person time bias or survival bias. Like, um, why didn't you consider, or would you consider the approach of cloning sensor and weighting versus the others? Sure. Um, so, uh, given the short uh, period of, of follow-up, and this was a point to intervention, that is essentially what we did because um, the we treated receipt of uh, convalescent plasma as a point intervention of any of those times, and then we pulled the results. Uh, rather than having some regime of saying do not get convalescent plasma for the first two days and then receive it a third day, and so rather than having to uh, clone, sensor, and wait, we just restrict to those who either received convalescent plasma on that day of interest. Uh, or not, um, but these are essentially the Thank you very much, Aaron, and congratulations for your work. Thank you.